welcome to part three of uh, Covenants. We've been looking at the, the build-up uh, towards the launch of the first covenant from God, which was uh, Abraham's covenant, and this week we move on to uh, the Mosaic covenant, the covenant that God made with his nation Israel through Moses. Let's pray before we start then. Heavenly Father, we just commit ourselves to you. We need the unction of your Spirit, Lord. Whether we're teaching or listening, we need the assistance of your Spirit to enlighten truth to us, to cause it to settle into our hearts, to help us to understand uh, the depth of what you're trying to teach us and show us. So we commit ourselves to you and we pray, Lord, that you will just enlighten us this evening, give us a deeper understanding of yourself, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I said last week that I would uh, recap because uh, this course is longer than any other course that I do. It's over eight weeks and uh, I think it's good that we approach it very slowly. It's very important, the whole subject, because it, it spans the whole scope of Scripture. It, it's, a, it's, it's, it's about everything that we're really concerned with. It's about the fall and how God in his mind wants to restore things after the fall. And God doesn't rush it. He takes thousands of years to develop different covenants. And he, he starts with one. He expands it to the second and the third and finally to the fourth. And today we live in the new and final covenant. But all the other covenants are still there. They are everlasting covenants and they still hold uh, some importance to us. Last week we looked at the Abrahamic covenant. It's simple in one way, and yet it, it's vastly important as well. It's simple because it's God making a covenant with just one man. One man, Abraham. This is where he starts. He said to him very simply, I want you to trust me, and I want you to obey me, and if you do, I will bless you in your life. I want to start with you because my, my goal, my aim is to bless the whole world, but it must start with you. What is this blessing then he wants to bring into his life? We looked at this and we saw for this covenant, along with all the other covenants, it falls into three categories. The first thing he said, I want to bless your seed. In other words, uh, you haven't got children, I want to give you a child. And of course we looked at what the seed was, whether it was just a person or a whole group of people. And that was the first thing. He said, I want to, I want to give you a child. But then he goes on to say that you will be the father of a great nation. And he said, after that, you will be the father of millions of people. Remember, he took him out at night and he showed him the stars. And of course, we can't see the stars in Britain very well from many places. But there he saw thousands and thousands of stars. And he says, I want to give you this number of children. And just in case you don't get it, see the sand on the seashore. I want to give you as many children as there are grains of sand on the seashore. So he is the father of the nations. He is our Father, if you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, he is spiritually your Father of faith. It goes right back to him. With the promise of the seed then and children, there came the promise of land. This is the second part of the covenant that we'll see running through all the covenants. The land is a gift from God. The world is the Lord's and everything in it is his, but he wanted to gift these, his children, with land. And we're going to see as we study the other covenants, there's land and more land, and eventually for us, we will end up occupying the whole world. That will be part of, of what God has promised to us. Third, the third thing he promises him, so the first he promises him seed, then he promises him land, and then he promises him a universal blessing. He said, I will bless you spiritually and I will also bless you materially so that all the peoples of the earth will be blessed by you. So that was in the covenant that he first cut with Abraham. 
our salvation, the salvation that we enjoy through Jesus Christ, has brought us into that covenant. So the promise he made uh, to him applies to us today. And of course, by the time we get to the, the end and we realise what the, the new covenant is, we'll see all the promises that are ours in Christ. So this week, we're going to look at the covenant that God made uh, with Israel, the nation, and he made it through Moses. We're moving then from a covenant that was made with a person or his family, really, to a whole nation. It is expanding, and we will find that eventually this covenant expands to incorporate the whole world. Between Joseph and Moses, there was a period of about 400 years. So there had already been, uh, in this period of time, this 400 years, a partial fulfilment of the promise that God made to Abraham. Because already his children had started to multiply to be a great nation. Remember when um, Jacob went down to Egypt after all that with Joseph and everything, and then they, this, this group come and he brings them all into Egypt and they went to live in Goshen. It says there were 70 of them. 70 made up that extended family. We find that 400 years later, there's two to two and a half million of them. Uh, so you can work out the sums yourself, but I'm not going there. Okay, so it, it, had, it had grown enormously from just this small group of people to actually millions of people. Now, the sad thing about it is that they were slaves. They, they were an extended, enormous family, but uh, we know that uh, in Egypt the Pharaoh became frightened of them and the way they were multiplying and growing, and, and so uh, he ended up turning them into slaves uh, to to do the things he wanted to do. It was in this situation of them being slaves uh, that, that God, um, he declared that he would uh, move uh, in their situation. It says that he remembered the covenant that he had with them. It says in Exodus 6 and 5, Moreover, he says, I have heard the groanings of the Israelites, remember they were slaves, whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant with them. Now, it isn't that God forgot it, because God can't forget anything. What he's really saying is, I recalled it at this time. I wanted to... Uh, uh, Effect it. I, I decided that now is the time that I need to move on behalf. We find that when God does this and he starts to move through uh, Moses, he reveals a name to Moses, which he will then reveal to uh, the whole of uh, the Israel people. The name by which you call someone is very important. Uh, <laughs> We've become very familiar with names, aren't we? Like everybody's our friend now, so we just call them all by their names. But years ago, we didn't do that. We sort of, a person's name, we would give people honour and respect by calling them Mr. Something or Mrs. Something, and you would do that until you were given permission to, to call them by something else. Uh, you can call me by my first name, they would say that. But that would take time. You would want something. But it's now, I'm your, I'm your mate now. I've only met you for five minutes and I'm your friend and you used to call me by this very familiar, friendly name. So all that's gone to pot a little bit. But God, when he spoke to people, he would refer to them by his name. When he first spoke to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, he referred to them as El Shaddai, the Almighty One. But because he decided he would enter into a covenant relationship with them, he changed it. He changed it to the name I Am. It's a strange name. In Hebrew, that would be Yahweh, or the translation of that is Jehovah. And Jehovah is a name that God, it was a covenant name of God. It was a name that God chose to give 
those that he wanted into, into a covenant with. Let's go to a passage of scripture. It's Exodus chapter 6. There's a terrible translation here that you need to fiddle with. So uh, this is an interesting thing to do. You have to do this with the Bible sometimes. Uh, I don't do it. It's what the, uh, the people who have uh, translated it do. In Romans, uh, sorry, in Exodus chapter 6 and verse 2, it said, God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. Now when he said, I am the Lord, that name I am is the name Jehovah. So he is saying, I'm going to give you a new name by which you can call me. You don't have to call me El Shaddai anymore, the Almighty One, because that's how God would be like, I'm Mr. Somebody, but now my name is Philip. You understand the similarity? He says, I am El Shaddai, the Almighty One, but now he says... I am the Lord. My name is Yahweh. My name is Jehovah. He said, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob as El Shaddai, God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, now this is where we've got to fiddle with this, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I looked down the bottom and I thought, that doesn't make sense. Instead of I did not, it should say, did I not, which changes the whole meaning. So let me read this to you again. I appeared to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, the Lord. Now, whenever you see the Lord written uh, in the Old Testament, that's Jehovah. It's written with a, a big L, and then capital O-R-D. It, it's a very special way. And it means Jehovah. And it says, uh, but my name is the Lord. Did I not make myself known to them? I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Cana where they lived as aliens. So what he is saying is, I am a covenant God and I have come to you, and I am no longer the Almighty One, but I am your covenant Lord. I'm entering into a covenant with you. And he makes mention of the covenant there, doesn't he? I am establishing my covenant with them. So he first only gave his name to the three patriarchs, to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. Now he's appearing to Moses and saying, I am now giving you permission to call me the Lord, not the Almighty One. And this name that I am going to give you, the Jehovah name, all of the nation of Israel can call me Jehovah as well. So he was giving them permission to use this more friendly covenant type of name. The name had only been known, as I say, to the patriarchs. It is a name related to salvation. It also denotes covenant keeping. So God had just given this friendly covenant name to Abraham and to his son Isaac and his son Jacob. But now he was going to give this covenant name to a whole nation of people. When we received the Lord Jesus Christ as our Saviour, he gave us the covenant name. It's been given to us as well. We're in this privileged position. After the deliverance from Egypt and the crossing of the Red Sea, they journeyed to Mount Sinai. And it was at Mount Sinai where Moses, remember he goes up the mountain and he receives the law from God well, more than he's received more than just the Ten Commandments, but all the other laws as well, although we talk about just the ten that were written on the, on the tablet of stone, uh, but there were other laws as well. And he also receives the pattern for the tabernacle, which is the pattern by which we should approach God. This was God giving the covenant to Israel, when he gave him the laws on Mount Sinai, this was the covenant 
the document of the covenant. He didn't do that with Abraham. He simply spoke to Abraham and he made verbal promises to him. Now he is he's doing more than that. He's, he's expanding it and he's, he's giving something written down that Moses can take and present to the people. This is what it says in Exodus 34, this is 27 to 28. Then the Lord said to Moses, write down these words, for in accordance with these words I have made a covenant with you and Israel. He was making his covenant with a nation, but obviously it was Moses who was representing them to the Lord. Moses was there with the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights without eating bread or drinking water. That's impossible. You can't do that. But in the presence of God, you can do all sorts of things. So this was a very unique, special event that was taking place. A big historic step for us, the church. So we've seen this big step with Abraham. Now another massive big step with Moses. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant. And it just puts there the Ten Commandments. And so that was the, the moral law that he was given them, but there were other laws as well. I made a statement there in the notes. The Mosaic Covenant, that is the covenant with Israel, is an expansion and an application of the Abrahamic Covenant. The promise made to a chosen family is now extended to a chosen nation. So keep this in mind all the time. First God meets a man and he makes a covenant with a family. Then he meets another man and he makes a covenant with a, a nation. This family has grown into a nation. Then eventually he's going to make a, a final covenant with the church through Jesus Christ. And we know the covenant then extends beyond a nation of people to the whole world. This is where we're going with this. The Abrahamic covenant is not replaced by the Mosaic Covenant, but it's an expansion of it. Covenants are everlasting. Sometimes we think, oh well, we don't have to bother with the Old Testament, we've just got the New Testament. But if you don't, if you don't read the Old, you're going to, not going to understand the New. And so much of the Old, it travels through into the New. Some of it stops at Christ, as Christ fulfills some things that don't need to continue into the new, but a lot of things travelled right through the cross and have come into the new. We don't live under law, we live under grace, but the principles, the, the ideas which God still wants us to live by, they're the same. God can't change. If it's wrong to do something in the Old Testament, it's wrong to do it in the new. It's changed from law to grace. We're going to spend a whole week seeing later how, how, what that means and what it looks like. We might have a little look tonight at, at just one of these things that's changed uh, from the old to the new and trying to understand in advance how it's changed. Although some things are the same, but because it's grace and not law, there is a change in it for us. So the three parts of the Abrahamic covenant, remember, they're the seed, the land, and the universal blessings, they're in this covenant as well. But they're expanded. Instead of being for just uh, Abraham's son, it's now going to be for uh, the whole nation. And the land that he promised him, that hasn't expanded because he said to Abraham 600 years uh, before Moses and all that, he said, see the land where you're living, this land of Canaan. He says, I'm going to give it to you but you're not going to get it for another 600 years. So he was way, way gone by then. But he says, listen, if I make a promise to you, I, I see you with all your children. It's, it's like talking to you is talking to the whole thing. I think it's important that we understand it's not just me and my Christianity and my relationship with God and my salvation. All those things are true, but we're part of something enormous. We've got to somehow understand what this is, the enormity of it. We, we are part of this enormous family that's probably made up of 
you know, five billion people, they say. Well, there's two and a half billion Christians, they say, in the world today, and that same number have gone before. I mean, the, the people don't know this. So we're part of this family of five billion that has been around for thousands of years. And, and this, these are our ancestors. This, this person, Moses, this person, Abraham, they're like ancient relatives of ours. We need to understand that. We need to see ourselves as part of this great, big, enormous thing that God has been doing for thousands of years. And we fit into this enormous, enormous thing that is, is just flooding the whole world. And you think, oh, just little me. There are no little me's. Or oh, we're all little me's. One or the other, we're all important and vital in the part of filling. It, it was like there's all these holes, billions of holes to be filled, and you are one of them. You filled this space, and it's you, and it's you. Uh, see, I think often we feel so small and little about ourselves. We, we lose sense of the wonderfulness of what we've been brought into. We, we think, oh, if I would even say, oh, I mean, I've preached about we don't have to sin and we can live like Jesus. And you know people are going, no, I don't believe in that. It's like, no, see yourself. Jesus said, come follow me, come, come be like me, come live like me. He, he studied under his rabbi, God, Father, and he learned how to walk in obedience to God's word. And so he's saying, we do the same. We've got a rabbi and his name is Jesus, and we follow him, and we do exactly what he does. The students of the rabbi did that. They adjoined themselves, attached themselves to a rabbi, and they did everything that the rabbi did. They just simply copied him. And, and so we are doing the same sort of thing. So don't think of yourself small and nothing and insignificant. See yourself as this magnificent part of the tapestry of God's world and we are part of that it doesn't make you arrogant and proud it just makes you realize the position that you have in Christ you are special and unique and there is no one else like you and God fashioned you and made you and has cared for you and looked after you to put you into that place where you will live with him in eternity the seed in Abraham's covenant, I said, uh, the promise was to his son. That's it. it. It was simple. He had really, well, he had a few children, but he had one son, really. Although, as I said, billions were going to follow in years to come, centuries to come. What was the seed then as far as this new covenant with Moses or with the, the nation of Israel through Moses? What was it all about? It says in Exodus 4, 22 and 23 this is what the lord says israel is my firstborn son i told you let my son go so now where it was abraham and his seed his child it's now god is speaking about israel as his firstborn his son it's expanded from one man to a nation so son and firstborn are the collective terms for Israel. In Hosea 11 and 1, it says this, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called him. So Israel was considered to be God's son. This is the seed, the seed that has grown from one to a nation of people, two millions of people. Also, Israel is the people of God. It says in Exodus 5 and 1, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, let my people go. In addition to that, the, the son, the firstborn, the people, they were his nation. They're also a nation. It was at this point, because they had grown to this size, they could call themselves a nation. They were an ethnic group. What does that mean? We use that 
quite a lot this today, those terms, an ethnic group. It's a human group that are racially the same, they have a common religion, they have often a common language, so they speak the same language, and so they, they are an ethnic group that can be considered a country in their own right, or a nation in their own right. So Israel was once a family, but it's grown so big it becomes a nation. Sometimes I think, sometimes you know, churches, they, they start with little home groups, you know what I mean? And, and we're just like, oh, we just love the Lord and we love being together and we're about 12 people. But then it moves from becoming this cosy little group to a church. Something happens. What happens? They grow in number. They start to identify themselves together as a people. It's almost the same pattern that we have here. Of course, we also know that for a nation to form itself, what it usually draws up is a constitution or a series of laws by which it structures itself. And here, God is giving them a constitution. He's giving them a covenant, something written out, the rules by which this nation would live. So now Israel coming out of Egypt, they weren't a nation in Egypt. Now they're coming out, they are the people of God, a royal nation for their Lord. Different from other nations because they're bound to God by his sovereign choice. His nation his people, special, different. He calls them his son, his firstborn, his people, his nation. There's a couple of other names as well. They're God's, he calls them their inheritance. They're his inheritance and they're also called his treasured possession. Psalms 33 and 12 said, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. So God is making a real uh, big thing of these people. These are his people. This is now his children. This is stage two of this tremendous uh, movement of covenants that are going to bring fallen humanity back into relationship with God again. And they are a community, he calls them a community. The covenant made them a community in the same way in the New Testament makes the Christians a community. We are in this world today, the Christian community. We are his sons. We are the people of God. More extensive than a nation, it now covers the whole world. And if you meet Christians from anywhere in the world and you sit down and talk for them for a while, you know what I'm talking about. There's some sort of relationship from one Christian to another. You might have never seen them before, but there's something in them and there's something in you that it just, it just works because we have the same father. So we're brothers and sisters. It's, it's not a, a natural physical thing, but it's definitely a spiritual and to some extent that's more powerful than the natural relationship of, of brother and sister. The second part then of the covenant, we've looked at the seed uh, now we're going to look at the land. The theme of the land is major in all of Israel's history. Their salvation, when they were brought out of uh, being slaves, is expressed like this. It describes them as bringing Israel out of the land of Egypt and into the land of promise. Yeah, interesting. Interesting. You think, well, what's the land got to do with anything? With God, it means a lot. So they were coming from the land of Egypt to the land of promise. The land, it's a gift. And it comes from God with love to his people. 
the world, the world is our land. It's ours. We possess the land. Sometimes we talk about this in evangelical terms, don't we? We talk about Hastings and we talk about possessing the land. Uh, almost like spiritually, when we win souls, this land becomes ours. It's as though the souls of, of Hastings, where we are, are connected to the land. And if you win the souls, you win the land. This territory uh, comes with it. We speak in those sort of terms. Maybe you've, you've marched around something to claim it and you're claiming the land. You say, well, it's all a bit funny. Well, it is a bit funny because it's to do with the spiritual thing that goes on. So we know that this, this gospel will be preached where? In every part of the world. The gospel will go to every land. Every group of people will hear the gospel and through hearing the gospel and the gospel being taken, that land is connected to the people. But although the land is given, Israel still has to possess it. You see, church, the world is yours, but we have to possess it because the enemy is camped in it and we've got to dislodge him because God wants to gift us with territory. It's, it's, you understand, I'm mixing it all the time. He wants us to possess souls, as it were, for the kingdom, but we possess land when we possess the souls. It's part of the covenant, the two always go together. They couldn't take the land by their own power. Only with God's help and in God's way. We know this, don't we? They could only take, when they crossed the Jordan, they could only take Jericho the way that God said and with his help. And then once they'd done that, they thought, oh, there's a little place called A here. We'll just wipe this out. I mean, for heaven's sake, we've just taken Jericho. Let's go take this next piece of land. And God says, well, have a go then. Well, he didn't say that, but that's how I say it. Okay. And so they have a grow. And of course, it goes nowhere. They, they, they're just... They lose uh, some of their soldiers and things. And so they, they weep and they, you know, come before the Lord and so on. And he's saying, listen, you'll possess the land the way I say you'll possess the land. That's how churches expand and grow. They wait on the Lord for the strategy that God wants to give them. If we look at other people the way they do it, we're going to go wrong because that's not God giving us the land. I know churches that have grown because they have great worship. I've known churches to grow because they've done deliverance ministry. I've known churches to grow because it has great preaching. I've known churches to grow for 101 different reasons. Well, it seems that that's the reason. That's what attracts the people. So you say, I know what we'll do. We'll bring in some great worship. It doesn't make no difference. We'll start doing deliverance. That doesn't help. We'll bring in big name preachers. That doesn't help as well. Well, it might help for a minute because people rush and then they rush out again when it's not. So what we have to do if you're thinking or playing about church expansion is to come before the Lord and say, Lord, this is your land. You need to show us how we take the land. You can't get it out of a manual. I always have a little giggle when they, you know, they talk about church growth books and manuals and seminars and conferences. Now, that's fine. They're just telling them how they did it. I get that. But that doesn't mean that you're going to do it the same way. They could only take it with God's help and God's way. The land, the land always belongs to God. It's interesting. It's a gift from God to his people but he holds on to the title deeds. It could not be when he gave it to the nation of Israel, he gave certain parchments of land to different tribes. And he said, it has to stay in this tribe. If, if you end up having to sell land to someone else to get yourself out of debt, when the year of Jubilee comes, you've got to give that land back to that tribe. 
You've got to give it back. So he had overall control over it. And because they didn't do that for a long, long time, that's when he sent them into captivity for 70 years because they had refused to do the things that God had said. It's important to God, you see. It was just a land issue while they went into captivity. It was nothing to do with the way they lived. It's just that they ignored what God told them to do in respect of the land. The land was a symbol of blessing. Remember what he said about it. He said it was a good and a spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. That's what he had promised them. Of course, that's what eventually they went in to possess under Joshua. The land then is always associated with rest. It's a particular quality of life that he wants us to enjoy and this is what he wants the Christian to enjoy doesn't he he wants us to enter into our rest a place where um, our enemies don't trouble us there's no internal strife as it were in the land and the fulfillment of God's promise is there for us So the land that always goes with the seed is about entering into one's rest and fulfilment in the Lord. The land always belonged to God and God dwelt amongst his people. Remember, we read this right at the beginning. The thing that God desires is that I will be your God and you will be my people and I will dwell in the midst of you. And so God is always wanting to be in the midst of his people where they're living. We know from scripture that if we sin, we're told it pollutes the land. Where we are becomes polluted. So there's no rest for us. When we sin, We have no rest. We open the door to the enemy to attack. There is internal strife when we sin. And the fulfillment of God's promise of rest is gone. Rebellion and unfaithfulness could mean that the occupation of the land which God was giving them was lost. And we know this is true. Through all the history, we see them breaking the promises and their unfaithfulness. Then God would send an enemy to them. He would take over the land and they would have nothing but unrest. And and so the land we see is constantly in relationship to the covenants that God has. The land that we talk about in the new covenant is rest and peace with God. The third promise that we read about with Abraham is here as well. It's the universal blessing. The role that God has in store for Israel was the most exalted imaginable. In his heart, he saw this nation now that he would bless and prosper and look after and care for. All they had to do was be obedient. Just be obedient and the blessings would flow into their life. God had chosen these people amongst all the people in the world. He had crafted them as it were. He had taken that first man and from that first man he had developed these people, this nation for himself. God wanted to dwell in the midst of them. And we see that he did. They generally appreciated the earth and that God was in the earth with them, but they had much more than the other nations. They might have appreciated there was a God. They didn't know it was Jehovah God, but they knew there was a God that was blessing with the seasons and everything else. They knew this as well, but they knew a whole lot more. See, as they travelled through the wilderness with God, somewhere where they should never have been, God was in the midst of them, wasn't he? There was a pillar of fire 
and a pillar of smoke, God dwelling in the midst of them. They just had to look and they knew that God was dwelling in the midst of them all the time. They're then in the tabernacle, if we go into the holiest of holies, we see the mercy seat and the, the two angelic beings above the mercy seat, and there is a ball of fire. We call it the Shekinah glory of God, and it is, it is evidence of the presence of God in their midst. So there was the tabernacle in the middle of the camp, and everyone was camped around. So God was in the very heart and the very centre of his people. And we know that God... At this time, with these people, he appeared to the leaders, both Moses and Joshua, face to face. Have you ever imagined what that was like? To look into the face of God? I mean, we look at his body sometimes and it just seems a mass of fire, it says. And it's like they looked into his face. He spoke to them face to face. He said to these people, I want you to be a nation, a kingdom of priests for me. What an exalted position. I will be God and you will be my people and I will bless you and you will go out into the world and you will be a blessing to everyone in the world and you will bring them to me. Mm. This wasn't going to happen, was it? This wasn't going to happen. They couldn't do this. He said, I want, to, I want to meet with you all. Prepare yourself, clean yourselves, wash yourself, purify yourself for three days. And then he says, I will be up the mountain. And then he says, when you're ready, you come. But come orderly, come in the way you should approach your God. But they came. And of course, what they saw terrified the living daylights out of them. The smoke and thunder and everything. And it was just, it said, it said even if Moses, Moses was terrified. So if Moses was terrified, I don't know what it did to these poor people. And of course, they took one step back and they said, no, 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 no. We're not going there. His desire was that they would come to meet with him. And then they would be a royal priesthood out into the whole world, being priests for their king they said no and so God had to wait until we came along and now we are his royal <coughs> priesthood and if you go into Hebrews there's that wonderful uh, illustration it's in 12 or something like that or 13 I don't know where it is I forget now but it's like what it was like approaching uh, God in the wilderness and then what it's like for us and it compares the two together it's such an exciting passage we have come you know to God and to angels and to the saints and all that stuff it, it's so thrilling God had to put this plan away to one side until the people we would step forward the church fulfills that priestly role. We receive such blessing from God that we can go out into the world and show the world how wonderful that is. But to receive the blessing and to take it, we have to live in the covenant. I strongly believe that the church lives quite low in its covenant relationship with God. That's why we don't see everything that we believe that we should see. We believe that we should see healings. We believe that we should see people receiving uh, the, the wonderful touch from the Lord or, or receive deliverance or, or just come into the kingdom. There should be something so brilliant and wonderful about the church of Jesus Christ that people would just... Just say, I must have what you have. Why? Because we take blessing, both material and spiritual blessing, into the lives of people. And so they respond and say, I want to be a child like you of this wonderful God that you're showing me all about. Let's take a little break there and uh, we'll come back after the break. Thank you.
Uh, welcome back. If the Abrahamic covenant was a covenant of faith, the Mosaic covenant is a covenant of obedience. It stresses that we are obedient to the law that he's given us. It couldn't be stressed with the Abrahamic one because there was no law. Everyone has, is born with the law of Christ within their hearts and everyone chooses or should choose to do the good thing because God wanted to give a law to show the people what God expected of them. Make that clear. Because the terms of the covenant are always set by God, the necessary response on man's part is always obedience. It says in Exodus 19, 5 and 6, it says, Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possessions. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. So we could say that obedience is the same as keeping the covenant and disobedience is violating the covenant. So when we break the law or the instructions or the directions that God has given us, we're violating the covenant relationship we have with him. Just as we said from man's side, there is no participation in the covenant without faith, we can equally say that there's no participation in the covenant without obedience. And that still applies today. We need to know the new covenant, the new testament, and we need to obey it. And if we obey it, the blessings are automatic. That's if we're talking about walking in righteousness. If you walk in righteousness, God blesses you. If you don't, God doesn't bless you. God's not saying, oh, I won't bless you. He's saying, I can't bless you. It's not possible for me to bless you. So you must walk then in the covenant. Although keeping the covenant involves obedience to its terms and conditions, the terms and conditions don't make the covenant. It might just get a little bit technical here, so just stay with me a little bit. This is where a covenant differs from a contract. So let me say that first sentence again. Although keeping the covenant involves obedience to its terms and conditions, the terms and conditions don't make the covenant. A contract is formed by terms and conditions. We're used to a contract. Terms and conditions that are set down. You buy something from somebody, they say, if you do this, it'll work. Obviously, if you don't treat it in this way, it'll break. Now, if you treat it well and it breaks, we'll give you another one. If you treat it not the right way and it breaks, we won't give you another one. They, you fulfill your terms and they will fulfill their terms. A contract is formed by terms and conditions to which the parties have agreed to. Agreement to the terms creates a contract. A covenant is formed by the bond of personal loyalty. So what's important in our covenant with God is not the law or the terms and conditions, but it's personal loyalty to God first, into which the parties enter. So yes, God puts down the law, the terms and the conditions, but he said, leave that there. What is important is that I have a personal relationship with you. And if this personal relationship works, you will keep these, I know you will. Because in the Old Testament, they couldn't do that. So God had to deal with the fact that they couldn't deal with it. And in the new covenant, he's made it possible for us to keep the terms and conditions. But it's not keeping the terms and conditions that make for the covenant. It is the relationship we have with God 
the terms and conditions arise out of the bond that we have. They do not create the bond. So I could say, no relationship, no covenant. Even if you keep all the rules, if you haven't got a relationship, it doesn't cut it. We must have this relationship and then we have a covenant through relationship. But God says, I set the rules, so here they are. This is how I want you to live your life. And we say, thank you very much. I want to live like that anyway, because I want to be in covenant with you based on a relationship. It's impossible to be a Christian if you don't love God. It's impossible. It's impossible. You could keep all the rules and it's still not working. It won't work because the, we have a covenant relationship that's based on relationship. But the, the law or the, the conditions that he set down, they explain what the particular bonded relationship entails for both parties. That's simply what it is. I'm going to try and expand it a little bit more. The law tells me how God would like me to live. If I keep the law, I will automatically be blessed by God. But I, I do not keep the law for the law's sake or to be blessed by God. I don't keep the law of God for the law's sake because God said it. And I don't keep the law so that I would be blessed. I keep the law because I love God. Just, if you need to switch that around in your head, because we, we are creatures who put ourselves under law. And God says, no, we've got to turn this around. This actually applied to the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. God knew this. God knew that if people loved him, it was a lot easier for them to keep the law. If they didn't love him or have a relationship with him, it was impossible for them to keep the law. They didn't have the, the wherewithal within themselves to do it, and God knew that was a problem because he deals with that through Christ and the coming of the Holy Spirit. The covenants we have with God are not based on keeping the law, but they're based on loving God. I would say to you, don't try and stop sinning. Don't even try. Don't bother. Just concentrate on loving God more. Just it, just concentrate on loving God and the sin, you won't do it. You just won't do it because that relationship makes the other stuff work. Oh, the devil's crafty, I know. He's cunning and he trips us up and he makes us stumble sometimes. But get back onto loving God. Love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and energy. That's always, that's not New Testament, that's Old Testament. And then the keeping of the law is not a problem. For us in the New Covenant, it's easy. Because, because the Holy Spirit has entered into us to give us the strength to do this. By the Holy Spirit coming into us, he's brought the person of Christ into us, so Christ's life is able to live through us as we submit all the time to the voice of God, to the voice of the Lord, to the voice of the Spirit within us, as we submit to that, we can walk perfectly before our God. And that thing which the poor Old Testament saints had, which was, I've described it to you as like a motor inside that caused them to sin and to sin and to sin again and to sin again. When Christ shed his blood, he put pay to that that was in us that caused us 
to want to sin. He became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So the power of sin in us to make us sin, he dealt with it through his blood. The atonement dealt with that generator of sin within us. What do I have to do? I have to discipline myself and train myself to walk in holiness. There's no... <laughs> I often think, you know, people say, oh, come Holy Spirit, I want you to change me. And I'm thinking, that don't work. That don't work. It isn't magical. It isn't like you get a download of the Spirit and you walk out of church and you're a wonderful, brilliant person. That doesn't work. I want more of the Spirit, don't get me wrong, but I must discipline myself not to sin and not to do the wrong things. I walk on this road of holiness and I am tempted and things come at me, but I know the Word of God, I know what I have within me and I know the truth and I must make a decision. I don't do that, I don't say that, I don't go there, I don't do this. I walk this way and I can because the Spirit of God lives inside of me. <laughs> we want quick fixes, don't we? Come, Holy Spirit, break down every barrier in my life. I understand what you're saying, and he does, but it will take about five years, or 10 years, or sometimes 20 years to break down some of these stubborn barriers that we don't want him to break down. <clears throat> You were hoping for a good one tonight, weren't you? <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. The Greek word for uh, covenant or testament is the word diotheke, which means to set something out in order. That's what the covenant is, to set something out in order. The covenant sets forth terms and conditions because God does not act unpredictably or on a whim or fancy. Capricious is the word, I think. That's a bit of a posh word, though. So he doesn't do that. It's like he would do tomorrow what he did yesterday, and he'll do it the same the day after. He doesn't, he doesn't just waver all the time or think, oh, it doesn't matter today, or he has a bad day, and then he's going to be harsh on us. No, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. For Israel, the law, as the book of the covenant, didn't create the covenant relationship between God and Israel. It never created the relationship, but it articulated in detail how this was to be understood and what was involved in maintaining fellowship with God. So the book of the covenant, those first five books of the Old Testament, God said, listen, if we're going to have a covenant relationship, me and you, this is how I want you to live your life. I want a relationship with you, but to really to walk in that relationship, you have to live like this. Otherwise, we can't walk together. Israel was in covenant with God by grace, but the law explained what it then meant for Israel that God was their God and they were his people. When we come to the New Testament, which is what really we get excited about, although we must have all this Old Testament stuff in place. In the same way, the New Testament, the New Covenant, is the book of the new covenant for us. Just as he gave them the Torah and said, live by this book and then you will, we can walk together. He's given us the New Testament and says, now you walk, you people of the new covenant, you walk according to this covenant and you're going to be pleasing to me and we can walk in this relationship. So the book of the new covenant is the book that the Lord has given us. In it, God makes his covenant will and his promises known to us so that we're not left guessing as to what they might be. We have to look at the life of Christ. That's what is 
so preeminent about the Gospels. If you want to know how God wants you to live, you read about Jesus and you, you copy it. And you can copy it because he sent the Holy Spirit. The same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the spirit that lives in you. So I was challenging some people today and said, do you think you can live like Jesus? And of course, they said, no. That's what they believe. They can't. Well, I said, who else are you going to live like? He's the only example that we have. There is no other example. And Jesus came to show us what it was like to live in covenant relationship with Almighty God. It is God. God makes his covenant will and purposes known to us so that we're not left guessing what he wants us to do. I want to work through a little example. I'm going to compare the old with the new. It's not in your notes. I've taken a deviation now. Okay, we'll be back there shortly. I want to talk about financial giving. This is long. We all like this one, don't we? We all like all ears prick up now. You all, you all know this verse that I'm going to read to you, a couple of verses. It's from Malachi. Uh, all, well, vast majority of churches preach this and put you right back under law and say, listen, if you don't do what it says here, uh, it's not going to go well for you. It's only partially right, what they're saying. Okay, but let's have a... Let's have a dig into this anyway, see what we got. This is Malachi 3, 8 to 10. It says this. Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? He says, in tithes and offerings, you're under a curse. The whole nation of you, because you are robbing me, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse and there will be food in my house. Test me in this, and it goes on to say, I will throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing, you will not have enough room for it. Now, people do wicked things with this. They then preach a sermon how you should bring the whole tithe into the storehouse and blessing will come into your life. But if you don't bring the whole uh, offering into the storehouse, you won't be blessed. Well, they don't need to go to this verse at all. They should really preach from the new covenant and not from the old covenant. Not that the old covenant doesn't teach us things, but, but through Christ, we now have a new covenant. So can you just preach this giving business out of the new covenant and not the old covenant? Because it would be clearer because we're not like the old covenant people. Something has happened. So we have to go to 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 8. Now, as we read this, there are some things that are similar and some things that are quite different from what we read before. So we've got to work out what's similar and what's different. He says, remember this. Why does he say remember it? Because we have a propensity to forget it. Okay, he does this several times. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly, that's, you're a bit meagerly and mean with your giving. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. In other words, if you give generously, you will find generosity coming back to you. Sometimes it's material things. Sometimes it's a whole lot more than material things. Uh, you might not need material blessing, you might need loads of other sorts of blessings really in our life. So it's not only talking about the material. And I think in the Old Testament, he wasn't necessarily talking about it. It was much more enjoyable to live at peace in your life than to have lots of money. And of course, God knows that. And that's true for you and me. We want to be at peace more than to have loads of money. And, and, and money just sometimes creates more problems for us. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. 
And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. There are two parallel passages of scripture, really. One under the old covenant and one under the new. So really we need to focus on the one in Corinthians because we're living under the new covenant and not the old covenant. What is the same and what is different? That's what we must ask ourselves. Well, the things that are the same is, if you give, you will be rewarded. I read that in the old and I read it in the new. It says that. If you're mean, then God won't be generous with you. But if you're generous, God is generous with you. He says that in both the Testaments. God will reward, it says, in abundance. It says in both. He won't be mean with what he gives you. There'll be tremendous blessing in your life. Like I said, it might not always be material, but it would be what, you, what God knows that you need of, really, more than that. If you hold back, it isn't that God's being mean with you. You've tied his hands. He can't bless you. He wants to. He always wants to bless you, but you, you don't let him. Because you, being generous, you release him to do that. It's funny to talk about we release God, but God has tied himself to his word, and so he's not free to do it. We could call this the law of return, couldn't we? What you sow, so shall you reap. If you don't sow it, you can't expect a harvest from it. What is different, though, between the old and the new? The, the wonderful thing is, you see, now the Holy Spirit lives inside of us and Christ himself rules in our heart and life. We have a new value system, which is the fruit of the Spirit. Okay, Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control. Those things govern our life. They didn't often govern the saints of the Old Testament. That's why he said, I'm commanding you to do this. If you do this, this, this sort of thing makes me happy. But listen, I don't want you to do it because I tell you. I want you to do this because I love you. And if I love you and you love me, this is, this is the minimum that you would do. You would bring the tithe and you would bring it so the people could be blessed. Under the old covenant, there's a fixed amount. It's called the tithe. It's 10%. Under the new covenant, there's no fixed amount. You can give everything you've got if you want to. It's not limiting. Under the old covenant, if you don't give it to God, you're stealing from God. That's what it says, you've stolen. Under the new covenant, you're not stealing from God. You're just not being generous. The word is generous, you see. It's generous. We're called under the new covenant to be generous. We're called under the old covenant to be obedient to what he has told us to do. God is saying this under the old covenant. If you love me, you would be generous. But you don't. Or you can't. So... I will give you a law that will show you, if you did love me, what is the least I would expect of you. That's the purpose of the law. The law shows us what God would expect people if they did love him, if they had the conversion in their heart to make them a generous people. Under the new covenant then, what's different is the money is yours. It's all yours. It's not God. Now, I know there's teaching about stewardship and I'm, I'm fine with stewardship. It's like, well, everything is the Lord's. I understand it is the Lord's, but I made the steward of it. So although my life is the Lord's and everything, but God says, listen, I give this to you. You manage it. So although 
we have a certain amount of money and then people say, oh, well, no, it's not ours, it's the Lord's. That's a bit of a funny one because it's ours to, to spend how we want to. Isn't that what he said to Ananias and Sapphira, remember? He said the money was yours to do with what you wanted. Why did you say you did something when you did something else and you were so deceiving? Why did you do that? It was yours to do with what you wanted to do. The money is yours and you decide how much you want to give. There isn't no tithe thing attached to this. It's, it's not there. The word tithe is not there. He could have put it in there because that would, that would just mess everything up. Christ has set us free, you see. You're free to choose. In the Old Testament, they weren't free to choose. Christ has said, I've come to set you free. Free to allow the grace of God to operate through your life. That's what you're free to do. You're free to be generous. The freedom, the more freedom you have, the more generous you want to be. If you don't want to be generous, you're not free. <laughs> you're bound in some strange way to the fear that there won't be sufficient or God wouldn't supply or God isn't true to his word. When we're free, we're free to give everything if we wanted to. Now, we have sensible heads on our shoulders and we've got bills to pay and we've got mortgages to pay and we've got children to feed. And, and so you're not supposed to just wake up every morning and give everything away unless God tells you to, which he could do, couldn't he? He did to that rich young man who came to him. He said, well... Give it all away, come follow me. But he had a specific problem that he was perhaps dealing with. But the widow who only had two copper coins, she dropped it all in the treasury. So there's two examples there. So be careful, okay, just be careful, okay. Uh, God knows, God knows your heart and God will deal accordingly. Depending on the amount of grace you have in your life, the grace is this, is, is, what, is what God bestows upon us to transform our lives so we become more like Christ. Depending on the amount of grace in your heart, you will be able to be more generous. The more you give yourself to the Lord, the more grace of the Lord is in you, the more it's easy to you to be generous with what you have. The grace of generosity, because that's what we're talking about here, the grace of generosity of heart has replaced the law of command. That's it. That's it. See, I can't command you to pay your tithe because I'm dragging you back into the Old Testament to do that. Preachers that do that, naughty, they shouldn't do that. They shouldn't drag you back. They should just preach to you so you love Christ more and more and more. And then this grace of generosity, as you give your life to Christ, it just wells up within you. And now you've moved from a law of command to the grace of generosity within your heart. Jesus now lives inside you by the Holy Spirit, and to the extent you allow him to fill your life, you will be generous. Jesus was generous with everything. He gave and gave and gave and gave and served and served and said. He said the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom. He was prepared to give his life, let alone few bits and pieces that he had. Under the law, or through grace, it might look the same. It might look the same. You see, you could be tithing because you're under law, and this person could be tithing because of the generosity of the grace of God. To me, it looks the same. I don't know. You smile, both of you, when you put the money in the bag. You think you're fulfilling the law and this person says, I'm walking in the love of God and I want to do this. But what's going on in, the, in people's hearts is quite different. They're giving 
reluctantly or out of compulsion or what they feel they should give. And the writer in, in uh, Paul there is saying, you mustn't do this. You mustn't give under compulsion. You mustn't give because you think it's the law. You must not do this. You must give from the maturity of grace that is within your heart. That's how much you must give because I know then what you've given, you've given through love and because it's given through love, I can receive it joyfully. If you've given it any other way, I can't receive it. That which we've given under compulsion and command, it was unacceptable to the Lord. Only that which was given in love was acceptable. So whenever you're thinking, oh, I don't really want to do this, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't give it. You say, well, no, don't, don't. Wait, grow up until you can give and give and give and it'll grow the amount and in the end you'd want to give everything away that's the trouble isn't it you see every need and you want to meet it you want to yeah and you watch television and all these things come you know there's the there's the poor donkeys that are dying out in wherever they're dying you know and all broken down and there's deaf people over there and there's blind people's dogs there and you're thinking yeah we could give this and give this and give no, you can't do that you can't meet every need there's there's too many needs to meet we need to be prayerful and say, Lord, where do I invest this money? You need to invest most of it in the kingdom, I think. Because we invest where we can extend the gospel and where we know that Christian people are going to minister into the lives of precious people. Under the old covenant, you had to be commanded to tithe but under the new covenant, you give freely from the heart what you can give in love. The principle of sowing and reaping is Old and New Testament. It's quoted in both. And the, the law of return still stands. It's just the way it happens, the way that it works. And we mustn't put ourselves or be allowed to be cajoled or... Uh, threatened in some way spiritually to give under the old. We know that God requires us, or we know what he requires of us. Of course, he requires us to be generous, as far as we can be. We're not left guessing. You read the passage in Corinthians, there's no, there's no guessing. It's clear. I love the word of God when it's clear. He just said, listen, give what you've got in your heart to give. If you haven't got it, keep it then. That's it. That's clear. You don't have to say anything else. You don't have to say, why aren't you putting your tithe in the bag? Because that's not what he's saying. Now, you could say, well, I think a tithe is a good amount of which I should give. I'm not arguing with that. That's your decision, though. And you can put the tithe. You can put a tenth of your income towards the, the, you know, the building up of the church if that's what you choose to do. But that's your choice to do that. We're not left guessing. We know that we're to be generous on every occasion. <clears throat> God can't change. It's impossible. He hasn't changed from the old to the new, but the covenant relationship we have with God, it changes us. We have a far better covenant with far better promises than the poor Old Testament saint said. Theirs was all right. But this is far better, far, far better. So never step back into that old one. Uh, got to look at something else now. Uh, one more thing. One of the startling features of the covenant with Israel is its emphasis on holiness to be holy. There's lots of different meanings of holiness. Really what God is often saying with holiness is keep yourself separate for me, separated unto me. There's also a meaning of holiness of being pure. And so we really have to look when we read that word, what is he driving at here? Is he just calling me to a separated life or is he calling me to purity? To Israel first, God reveals his holiness. 
And because Israel belongs to God, holiness is not an optional extra. If you're in covenant with me and I'm holy, you need to be holy as well, he's saying. I'm separated for you, you're separated for me. It says in Leviticus 19, 1 and 2, the Lord said to Moses, all back there, speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, be holy because I, the Lord your God, I'm a holy God. So his expectation is that they would live a life of separation unto God. Firstly, the law is given to us to show Israel what it means to be holy. All the things he sets down in the law, he said, if you live like this, in my eyes, you're a holy people. You've separated yourselves from what all the other people in the world do, and your life is a life of purity. There's that passage in Leviticus. It just goes on and on and on and on about who you can't have sex with. Have you read that one? I mean, it's just amazing. It's just like, not with your auntie, not with your mother's sisters, brothers, uncles, cousins. And it just goes on and on and on and on. And you think, surely you haven't got to spell all this out. Yes. Because the other nations around them were living like that. They just, men owned women and they were sexual objects. It doesn't matter if it was your sister-in-law, or if it was your daughter, it was anyone. You just... And so God says, listen, no, no, this, listen to this. Now you just have relationships with your wife and no one else. He made it clear. See, that was separation, that was holiness, to be different from the other people. And all the other laws that he gave, and there's 160 of them or something, that he, he gave them there in the Old Testament. God makes his will known and he is consistent with his dealings with his people. Israel are given three categories of laws. He's given the moral law, which is the Ten Commandments. God's moral boundary rules for human life. You shan't do this, you shan't do that, you know, you know the Ten Commandments really well. Then he gave a group of laws that were called civil laws. And the civil laws was the application of the moral laws to public life. He said, if you act in this way, this should happen to you. If your son is rebellious, bring him here and we'll stone him to death. It's very simple. That's the law. Okay, how to deal with someone who breaks moral laws. Respect and honour your mother or father. If you don't, well, we'll stone you to death. So it was the application of those laws. Then there was a whole lot of other laws which were ceremonial laws. You know, the washing and the sacrifices and all that sort of stuff. So when Jesus comes on the scene, he fulfills all of the ceremonial laws so they got rid of when Christ comes. So what we're left now with is the moral law of God, which we would say that were the Ten Commandments, and to some extent, not all of them, but the application of the moral laws into public life, which are the civil laws. So some of these have remained and some of them stay. We definitely have the moral laws, we have some of the civil laws, none of the ceremonial laws. The law had another essential function. It says in Galatians 3 and 4, therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. So the law is good. Nothing wrong about the law. It can't be because God gave it to us. How does the law then lead us to Christ. How does it fulfill that function? This is what it does. By revealing to us the holiness of God and the requirements of that holiness, it reveals to man his sin. Let's go back to this chapter about who you can and can't have sex with. You read through that and you think, mm, okay, I'm not married, therefore, I'm operating if I'm having sex outside of the law. God says that's unacceptable. Now, walk around today and people think you're off your trolley, okay, because, oh, we've got to make sure we're compatible or something or something or something. 
sorry, that's wrong. That's just the end of it. It's wrong. It's wrong in any circumstances. That doesn't mean we condemn or we're nasty to the people. We just say, I'm sorry, I really love you, but what you're doing is wrong. It is wrong. And, and, and the law leads us to Christ. It tells us what's right and what's wrong. By revealing the root of sin as being within man, it demonstrates his total incapacity to live by external law. They couldn't do it, could they? They couldn't do it. They couldn't. And God knew. He knows everything, doesn't he? He knew it was just a stepping stone. And there would be another stepping stone until he gets to the new covenant when it's all possible that we can live according to what God requires of us. Why? Because the root of sin, which I keep talking about, that motor within us, he deals with it through the blood of Christ. Thirdly, it shoots man into the only possible means of justification before God. That is, through faith in Jesus Christ. There is no other way. We, to be justified in his presence, to be separated unto him, to be made holy in his sight, we must have Jesus Christ. Otherwise, it's not possible. We should always say, thank you, Father, for giving us the law. Because it is the law that has led us to Christ. And if you hadn't given us the law, we would never have known what purity was, what holiness was. And if we're to live with you, we've got to be holy. Now, there is a sense in which God has declared you holy in the same way his, he has declared you righteous in Christ. He has declared you holy. So from the minute you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you were born again, you were made righteous, holy in his presence. This evening I'm holy and righteous in the presence of God. And he set me on a road of which I'm walking down and slowly but surely I'm dealing by his grace with the sin that is in my life and as I walk down this road I'm shedding the old-fashioned ways of or the wrong ways the old ways of doing things and I'm embracing the new way of Christ back here I was potentially a new creation in Christ acceptable in his sight but as I progress down the road this stuff is falling off me and I'm trying to be like Jesus every step of the way. God bless you. Have a great Christmas. And uh, see you back in the new year. I think we're back on the 3rd. Anyway, you'll receive information about that before we get there. God bless you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.